declaring COVID-19 misinformation a public health crisis and the fight against it. And we hear from a San Diegan just getting back home after going over 500 miles to get away from the Calder fire. Days after Hurricane Ida makes landfall, the effects are still being felt, including here. Residents are waiting for gas. That story coming up. Have you seen this man? Police say he may be responsible for a string of arsons in North Park. Plus what the Pentagon is saying about claims that U.S. military dogs were left behind in Afghanistan. As Oceanside development is coming up fast, talks turn with what to do on the historical properties by the pier. California now has administered 48 million doses. And a vaccination milestone for California. News 8 at 6 starts right now. Tensions flare at the County Board of Supervisors meeting where a proposal to consider COVID-19 misinformation a public health crisis is being discussed. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. And I'm Shannon Handy. If passed, this would be the first such policy in the nation. But as News 8's Steve Price reports, we could still be hours away from a final decision. Supervisor Nathan Fletcher wants the county to declare COVID-19 misinformation a public health crisis, but dozens of county residents say what he's really trying to do is take away their right to free speech. And at Tuesday's Board of Supervisors meeting, they voice their concerns. We the people, Nathan Fletcher, will not comply with one more inch of our freedoms being taken away. There are no strings on me. They say the government is pushing mask mandates and vaccines on them based on constantly changing information coming from sources they don't trust. If you're at all concerned about misinformation, please hold up a mirror because the misinformation is coming from you. We will continue to fight for your rights. Supervisor Chair Fletcher says this policy is necessary after hearing a speaker at one of their last meetings promote the use of a horse deworming pill as a treatment for COVID-19. Nothing in this measure will take away anyone's right for free speech. Among Fletcher's recommendations for combating misinformation is creating a website where rumors are verified, giving residents a central resource for accurate information. To provide the public, you might have heard this, this is what the medical community believes is right, and here are the links for you to go get that independent validation. 262 people have requested to speak on this issue. The overwhelming majority of them are against Fletcher's proposal, and it led to this tense moment while he was trying to explain his reasoning behind it. This is the first official warning to the group that your outbursts are disrupting the conduct of the Board of Supervisors meeting. Public comments are expected to continue for at least another hour. We'll update you on the vote tonight on News 8 at 11. In downtown, Steve Price, News 8. Thanks, Steve. A vaccination milestone for California. 48 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been administered across the state. California is the first state in the U.S. to reach that number, but you have to keep in mind it's also the nation's most populated state. More than 80% of people over the age of 12 who are eligible have received at least one shot. California now has administered 48 million doses of vaccine. That's 18 million more than the next highest state, the state of Texas. California has also implemented the first in the nation vaccine verification or testing requirements for state workers and school staff. Last week, more than 643,000 vaccines were administered, a nearly 45% increase compared to mid-July. Tens of thousands of people in Lake Tahoe are having to evacuate their homes as the fast moving Calder fire continues to grow. It's now surpassed 190,000 acres. Governors of California and Nevada have declared states of emergency. News 8's Heather Hope spoke to one San Diego man who got out just before the roads closed. Yes, Mike Fernandez is just getting back home to San Diego after driving over 500 miles. He says yesterday in South Tahoe, sheriff's deputies went door to door, knocked on his friend's home, telling them they had to get out. Finally home from South Lake Tahoe and unpacking his truck in Rolando Village. 6, 630 yesterday and I got home a little after 630 today, so uh, took a while. 
Mike Fernandez lived in Tahoe for 10 years and went back for a visit until the Caldor fire cut the trip short. Today you can't see the sun anymore, you can't see the mountains anymore, it's the, the smoke is just completely socked in again. Then came the sheriff's deputy's evacuation warning. On Monday morning at 4.30 in the morning, we got the knock on the door saying that we need to leave. The Caldor fire has burned over 191,000 acres since August 14. Many Tahoe residents evacuated overnight. I'm a physician, and so my whole medical home office where I had to work for the last year is now squeezed into the back of the car. But getting out of town hasn't been easy with road closures and traffic. The town's crazy, just trying to get out. We're taking the bus, and this is the worst I've seen it for 32 years. The San Diego Humane Society is in Tahoe rescuing animals. One cockatiel, uh, 24 parakeets, and then a chameleon. Working in the Caldor fire smoke has been a challenge for the team. The air quality is really, really tough. The smoke is unreal. Um, it's raining ash. I don't know if you can see it. It's probably hard to see, but it's, it's like it's snowing out here. Many miles away, San Diegans hope for the best. I just hope they save South Lake Tahoe. That would be really really bad if they the fire got in the basin and destroyed the city. The Humane Society goes from call to call, saving some frightened animals. They are definitely scared though. Yeah. You know, we've got they've got strangers coming into their house, there's smoke all over. After ten days of rescues in South Tahoe, the animal officers will head back to San Diego on Saturday. Heather Hope, News Eight. And I was actually in Lake Tahoe last week and was forced to leave because of those fires. I will share my experience coming up at 630. Today, President Biden said his decision to end America's longest war in Afghanistan was the right one, despite leaving U.S. citizens behind. The State Department says it has been in contact with some of those Americans. As Natalie Brand reports, this comes as the administration also vets tens of thousands of Afghan refugees. President Biden addressed the nation less than 24 hours after the last U.S. soldier, Major General Chris Donahue, left Afghanistan, ending a two decades long war. I was not going to extend this forever war. And I was not extending a forever exit. The president says military commanders on the ground advised that ending the mission as planned was the best way to protect the lives of U.S. troops. For any soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine, and their family, your service mattered and it was not in vain. The administration estimates more than 122,000 people were evacuated while around 300 Americans remain in Afghanistan. Americans need to be able to be brought home. This cannot be our history. There is not an end to our commitment to American citizens who are in Afghanistan who want to leave. The State Department has moved diplomatic operations from Kabul to Doha, Qatar. Critics of the complete withdrawal from Afghanistan worry that it will impede the U.S.'s ability to collect intelligence and protect against future threats. We can strike terrorists and targets without American boots on the ground. U.S. law enforcement officials confirmed to CBS News the Department of Homeland Security has issued warnings that extremists could seek to exploit the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. DHS has deployed staff to assist in vetting the tens of thousands of Afghan allies arriving to the U.S. Natalie Brandt, CBS News, the White House. Tonight, the Cajon Valley Union School District confirms one of the families in its district was left behind in Afghanistan. Four families have safely returned. Two people are recovering after being shot in separate attacks on local freeways this morning. Tonight, officers are investigating whether it's the same shooter. First, a woman was grazed in the neck by a bullet around 2.15 a.m. on the northbound 805 near Imperial Avenue. Then, about 15 minutes later, a man was shot on eastbound 94 near College Grove Way. Both drivers are expected to be okay. Police say a dark sedan, maybe a Nissan Maxima, sped away from both scenes. If you have any information, call CHP. A preliminary hearing continued at the Vista Courthouse today for Jane Dorotic, who's accused of murdering her husband in Valley Center two decades ago. Dorotic, who is now 73 years old, was serving 25 years to life for the killing when her sentence was overturned last summer due to new DNA evidence. But the district attorney's office is still pursuing murder charges once again. San Diego police say a hotel employee tipped them off to an accused identity thief. Back on July 7th, the employee called police after a man tried to use several different credit cards that were not his to book a room. 
Detectives say that fits a pattern that's plagued area hotels now for months. When they found the 38 year old suspect in the parking lot, investigators say they recovered a binder with more than a dozen stolen identities along with a loaded ghost gun. The aftermath of Ida is still being felt in Louisiana and will be for quite a while. More than a million people don't have electricity tonight and the lights won't be back on for many of them for weeks. People also face a long wait when it comes to filling up their cars and other vehicles. Our Evan Narani is on the ground in Laplace, Louisiana. That's just outside New Orleans. In Laplace, 30 minutes outside of New Orleans, patience is running low. I wish I would have left before the storm. Maybe everything would have been a little better. Blocks away from the governor as he spoke, a line of dozens of cars. The rumor around the neighborhood that this independent gas station would reopen today. I don't have gas in my car. Everywhere I went at, it's, it's nothing. I'm scared I'm going to break down. And every time we pull up to a gas station where they say there's resources, it's no gas. Just over 48 hours ago, Hurricane Ida hit New Orleans as a Category 4 storm. Now residents say government assistance is slow to arrive. It's like disturbing, very disturbing. I never thought it would have been this bad. I mean, we would have left if we would have knew it would have been this bad. Government, we don't see nothing yet. The people we spoke with say they believe elected officials could have done more to prepare for a moment like this. And without that support, they say they're relying on businesses like this to help them. Why are you helping people? Well, we, that's what you do, man. Neighbors help neighbors. Y'all, this is a catastrophe. In front of the gas station, desperation. I ain't eaten nothing in about three days. Everything is in a frenzy at this time. It's chaotic. Behind it, the owner and his friends trying to hook up a generator. About an hour later, the gas station is up and running, open for business. We got it going. How about that? Everybody's happy. Man, 10 hours. We've been out here 10 hours trying to get gas. We just not got here. The governor of Louisiana spoke in a press conference earlier today. He says that there is no current timeline on when the debris will be cleaned up here around New Orleans. He says there is no timeline on when power will be restored, but that crews will be working around the clock until that work is done. In Laplace, Louisiana, I'm Evan Irani, News 8.